Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're ready for the first talk of uh, the uh, this morning's session uh, by Jacob Zimmerman on mixed period maps, definability, and algebraicity. Jacob? Great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so today I want to sort of continue um, along the same theme as yesterday. And um, instead of talking about the pure case, I want to um, explore the mixed case uh, a little bit and describe uh, what the story looks like there, both from uh, a definability perspective, which uh, Bruno said um, some stuff about, um, and also um, from the algebraicity and quasi-productivity perspective. So in the pure case, we had uh, we have the Griffiths conjecture, the image of pure um, period maps is, is uh, quasi-projective, and I want to describe what happens um, in the mixed setting. So, well, there we go. Um, to start, just a, a very sort of uh, brief uh, introduction to mixed high structures. Uh, if you have a quasi-projective variety with a polarization now, so you can think of that as just some embedding into projective space. Uh, and we don't assume anything about it having, uh, about X being uh, proper or smooth. So it's just an arbitrary quasi-projective variety. Nonetheless, uh, the Lin showed you can assign to, to its K singular cohomology um, a uh, integral graded polarization of mixed hard structures. So a mixed hard structure. And what this is, is look at its cohomology and you can give it a, uh, a decreasing filtration F like in, the, uh, like in the case for a regular hard structure. But now it also has some increasing filtration, which I'm going to call W dot. And uh, the idea now is that, first of all, on each graded piece for the weight filtration, this W filtration, um, you have an integral quadratic form, Q sub W. So this is sort of the, the polarization. And moreover, on each graded piece, uh, there's some compatibility between uh, this Hodge filtration F and this weight filtration W that I'm not going to write down exactly. But essentially, if you look at the induced filtration uh, by F, what you get is uh, an integral polarized, pure sort of hard structure of weight W. So this is the kind of thing that you get on an arbitrary variety, which replaces uh, the hard structure for um, a smooth projective variety. And the idea is we want to study these uh, in families like before. So we can uh, try to carry out the same kind of construction as we do in the pure case. So we fix the underlying vector space um, <clears throat> of the cohomology and with, with its um, integral sort of weight filtration um, and this family of uh, polarizations, these quadratic forms Q on each graded piece. And now we can let D just be the set of possible Hodge filtration. So D parameterizes these Fs in such a way that the, all the conditions are satisfied. It's sort of compatible with a W filtration and the quotients you get these uh, pure Hodge structures. And now if you want to talk about uh, the moduli, then again, uh, as a complex variety, you can do this uh, in a straightforward way just by taking the quotient of all these sort of framed mixed Hodge structures by the integral automorphisms. And now if you take your X and you put it in a quasi-projective family um, and you sort of require just by hand that the um, derived push forwards um, give you a local system, then you obtain a period map uh, from your base Y over which this family sits to M in the same way as before, where you sort of take a point and you send it to the mixed hard structure corresponding to the fiber. So you can still talk about these kind of period maps. And it turns out that uh, whereas before, uh, in the pure case, the key property to sort of making sure things were nice, uh, if you want to abstract away from geometry, was just Griffith's transversality. While that's still here, um, there's an important property of period maps to make sure they behave well called uh, admissibility, which is some kind of degeneration condition at the boundary 
uh, if in the case where Y is not proper, it sort of tells you uh, some condition about how your, your family has to look at the boundary. Uh, and that's also necessary to make sure that things are kind of well behaved. So I'm not going to define admissibility, but uh, we'll give some examples to explain why you need to insist on something else in the next case to make sure that things work out nicely. Okay, so uh, what I want to do now is I want to describe the moduli space of mixed hard structures uh, a little bit, sort of break it down um, into how it looks, and this will in turn lead us to uh, describing the definable structure on it in sort of a, a rather explicit way. So um, to do that, we first define the notion of a real mixed hard structure. So uh, the word real here just means that in the definition, instead of requiring that our, dub, our lattice and our W, our weight filtration are defined over Z, um, you forget the Z structure and you only remember the real structure. So only the lattice tensor R and the weight filtration tensor R. And then you say that your real mixed hard structure is real split. This is some sort of special property of, of mixed hard structures over R or Z. Uh, and the idea is that you can write it as a direct sum of just pure hard structures of different weights. So if you can take a bunch of pure hard structures, direct sum them, and the induced weight and Hodge filtrations give you something isomorphic to your, uh, to your mixed hard structure, you say that it's real split. So this is some kind of... Um, non-trivial condition, and uh, it gives you a sublocus. So if you look at your um, framed moduli space D, so D has a framing, we haven't quotient it out by the integral structure yet, then we call D sub R the sublocus of these uh, real split mixed hard structures. Then if you form your uh, relevant groups here, so G, let's call G the uh, automorphism group of um, our lattice, which now respects all our extra data. So it respects the weight filtration and it respects the polarization. So G, by the way, is no longer a, uh, a semi-simple group as it, or a reductive group as it is in the um, pure case. Um, it has a unipotent radical and its unipotent radical is easy to describe. It's just all the, um, I shouldn't say entries here, but it's, it's all uh, strictly upper triangular um, automorphisms. So automorphisms which not only preserve the weight filtration, but are the identity uh, on the graded pieces. Uh, and so therefore they'll trivially preserve sort of Q dot. Uh, this is the unipotent radical. And now the way that the group theory um, ends up working is unlike the pure case, um, your real group, your real points aren't enough to get a transitive action uh, on D. There's sort of too much information. So what you have to do is you have to add the complex points um, of your unipotent. So if you look at the real points of G and you add these complex points, you get something which acts transitively on all of D. Oops, sorry. But if you just care about the real split mixed hard structure, which is some sublocus inside D, that's acted transitively by the real points um, of your group G. Okay, so we're going to use both of, we're going to use this real split uh, locus as an intermediate step to understand uh, the entire locus. And uh, the way we're gonna get from uh, one to the other is uh, we're gonna study uh, these splittings. So if you have a real mixed hard structure, so in the pure case, uh, you can get an actual, you can go back and forth between filtrations and gradings in a sort of straightforward way. Uh, in the mixed case, the lean showed you can do something similar uh, so given a mixed hit, mixed hard structure, you can actually uh, get what's called a Delin splitting. So this is a bigrading of your vector space uh, indexed by pairs of integers PQ, which, so it's a splitting. So what that means is that you can recover both the Hodge filtration and the weight filtration using this bigrading in the following sort of way. You put together a bunch of these pieces, you can recover both the, the Hodge and the weight filtrations. And it's sort of as close to um, real as you can get. So ideally you would want that the uh, complex conjugate of JPQ is JQP. You can't quite guarantee that, but you can guarantee it up to some sort of smaller uh, indices here. Um, there's a unique splitting like this, 
Uh, and in fact, I didn't write this down, but you can characterize being uh, a real split mixed hard structure if uh, you can get on the nose that JPQ bar is JQP. That's another way to characterize uh, the real mixed hard structure, be being real split. Okay, so uh, given this kind of migrating, you can in particular get a splitting of your wave filtration just by taking the direct sum of these GRSs for these indices where R plus S is K. So in particular, this suggests for us to study the set of all possible splittings. We're gonna let SW uh, be all splittings of the weight filtration. So essentially um, all the compositions into subspaces, uh, which uh, sort of uh, give you lifts of the graded pieces. This is a natural action by your group. Now, as an intermediate step, we're going to consider this D subgraded, which essentially means uh, we're not going to care about the full mixed data. We're only going to care about the pure hard structures we get on the graded pieces. That's what this D subgraded means. It's a direct sum. I guess it should be a product, I guess, because it's a, it's a space. I'm, uh, I'm sure the best notation is. <laughs> but uh, this D sub K is just the moduli uh, that we studied uh, yesterday that Bruno talked about which just parameterizes pure hard structures. Okay, and so now you have this uh, very useful lemma, which allows you to study things pretty explicitly. It says that first of all, if you look at the real split locus, uh, what data does that have? Well, you can map it to this graded moduli space, which just means, again, you forget all the extension data between the pure pieces and just care about what hard structures you get uh, on the graded pieces. Moreover, it also maps to uh, splittings. In fact, because it's real split, it maps to splittings defined over R. Uh, is something pretty easy to check. And so you get this kind of map where you can remember either what's happening in the pure pieces and you also remember what's happening uh, in terms of the splitting. And it turns out this is an equivariant isomorphism uh, under the real points of your group. So in other words, to study the real split locus, it's enough to study these two guys kind of separately. And moreover, this descends very nicely to uh, your moduli space. If you care about the uh, real, the mixed hard structures, which um, are real split, then it's enough to remember on the level of moduli, just the graded piece and the splitting up to, uh, up to integral um, automorphisms by your unipotent here, the strictly upper triangular action. Now this quotient uh, is in fact compact because SW sub R is uh, just a UR um, torsor and U is a unipotent group. So it's real points mod it's integer points is just a bunch of extensions of circles. So that's got a canonical RL structure. We've already put um, an R um, L structure on the graded moduli, uh, M subgraded, just a product of a bunch of the pure moduli spaces. And so just this product gives you a canonical R L structure on um, your locus of uh, mixed hard structures, which are real split. So that's how you handle sort of that piece of it is just by reducing to the pure case together with remembering uh, this data of splittings, which is something very simple. It's some sort of like cell of a Grassmannian kind of thing. Okay, so now to extend um, this uh, structure to the full locus of mixed hard structures, you don't want to deal with just the real split one, those are pretty rare. Um, what you do is you do the following I don't know about trick, but there's this, uh, there's this, there's this um, idea where you can actually look at the full locus of mixed hard structures and there's a retraction that that has um, onto the real split locus. There are in fact, at least two well-known retractions. Uh, there might be more, I'm not quite sure, uh, but there are two that show up prominently uh, with the following properties. Here are the properties we want the retraction to have. So first of all, we want this to be trivial over the graded. So uh, this R, if you um, look at D goes to D sub R and then pass to the graded, it should, it should not do anything. It shouldn't affect uh, what happens to the, uh, the pure 
pieces. They should, they should have the same hard structure before you apply R as after. You want it to be equivariant over the real points. Really, we only care about the integer points, but because everything's going to be algebraic, that means you want it to be equivariant over the real points uh, so that it descends nicely to moduli because we're going to be quotienting by GZ. Um, and we want it to be kind of simple. So I wrote this as definable over R alg, but in fact, these are going to be like straight up algebraic, these attractions. So you want these three properties. Uh, and one is the Lean's uh, delta splitting, and the other is the closely related um, SO2 splitting. Um, so they're both retractions that have uh, these kind of nice properties. And we're going to, can I just check that uh, I'm still, because I can't see anybody on my screen. Am I disconnected or are people still hearing me? You are fine. You're Perfect. fine. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, so we're going to use the SO2 splitting in what follows. But um, I want to mention that uh, it's very possible that if we use uh, the, the leans, uh, the delta splitting, everything I say is still true. Uh, so we only know the results for the SO2 splitting, but in no way do we know that that's kind of the right thing to do. It just happens to be what, uh, what we could prove or what people before us could prove. Okay, but given such a retraction, uh, you can perform the following construction. If you have a definable fundamental domain um, on the real split locus uh, for, uh, for the, the monodromy gamma, which is GZ, giving the definable structure on the quotient. So you sort of, you can describe the definable structure by giving an appropriate definable fundamental domain. It's some Ziegel set thing. What you can do is you can just look at its inverse image under R inside D that's going to be some definable fundamental domain for gamma as well because of properties two and three. And because of property one, that's going to induce a definable structure on M. So in fact, if you have a map to D sub R, then uh, you can use that to give yourself a fundamental domain on D from the fundamental domain on D sub R just by pulling back. And then that'll give you correspondingly a definable structure uh, on M just by descending. Okay. So you can automatically sort of for free uh, pull back these definable structures. Uh, and here is the key theorem, which is uh, due to Brosnan and Perlstein, which makes uh, everything work for us. It's if you look at a, a map, just on a polydisc, a punctured polydisc, um, giving you um, an admissible variation of mixed hard structures. I'm going to call this phi, sorry. Um, then you can consider a lift of such a map to the universal covers. So here you can uh, write that as the upper half plane to the power of n. And here I'm going to lift m to, to d, to the frame moduli space. Then what you can do is you can uh, map to D, you can compose that with a retraction to D sub R, and then you can project that to SW sub R, to the splittings, the locus of splittings you get. And then the theorem they proved is that in this setup, <clears throat> the image of any vertical strip under these compositions is bounded. So that's sort of the concrete uh, geometric theorem that um, we need. And then from this, it's basically uh, a formal consequence once you have uh, this, uh, this data here. From this and, this the, and the work in the pure case and sort of the setup above, that uh, admissible mixed period maps are definable over R and X. Because essentially, the only extra piece that you have to uh, include is the data of these splittings. And this theorem is exactly the ingredient you need to make sure that that's tame as well. So I just want to uh, mention that, uh, so we, we picked the SO2 splitting here because uh, Brosnan and Perlstein proved the theorem for that splitting. Um, we don't, we have no idea if the theorem is still true for um, the delta splitting or not. Uh, if it's true in that case, then you would have this theorem for the corresponding definable structure given by the delta splitting. And moreover, it seems like, um, you would get a different definable structure in that case 
on uh, the mixed moduli space for which you still have all these period maps being definable, right? So there's no law saying there has to be a unique definable structure which makes this theorem true. Um, and the question of whether the delta splitting works or not is sort of, I don't know, open right now. We don't know the answer to that question. All right, so that's um, the story as far as the uh, definability goes. I'm sort of not gonna go into it much more. So now the main uh, algebraicity theorem, oh, I screwed up the name, I screwed up the capitalization again, um, due to joint work with Baker and Mutabarb, is the same as sort of before, if you now take an admissible mixed period map um, into, uh, for, from some algebraic base Y, then once again, you can factor it as a map to a quasi-projective variety uh, Z and a closed immersion iota. So the image under admissible mixed period maps um, is quasi-projective. Um, and then you have some geometric corollaries, like if you have the Lee Mumford stack with a quasi-finite admissible mixed period map, then it's core space quasi-projective like before. Um, cool. So what I want to focus on is sort of um, the quasi-projectivity now. The, the algebraicity works essentially unchanged from the pure case once you have the definability because you, you apply, if you recall the algebraization theorem I talked about yesterday was basically completely general. Uh, it just talked about having an algebraic base mapping into a, uh, a definable analytic space, which M now is. Uh, and in that setting, the image is an algebraic space. So there's like a minor hiccup there that I'm not going to go into where uh, you have to play some game to make this map proper. Um, unlike the pure case where you can sort of extend to any log smooth thing and get something proper, that's not true in the mixed case. You might have to do some additional blow ups, uh, even once you're in the log smooth setting in order to make sure your map is proper. You have to play some game with like toric varieties of the boundary that I don't really want to uh, go into, but you can nonetheless reduce yourself to that setting apply that theorem and then everything works the same as before. So I don't want to focus on the algebraicity. Um, <clears throat> instead, what I want to focus on is the quasi projectivity. Um, I want to explain uh, what sort of bundle gives you um, this quasi projectivity. In the pure case, it was just given basically by uh, the, the Griffiths bundle, or if you want sort of the, the curvature on the, on the target. Um, that's not the case anymore. So I want to explain the new sort of ingredient. Uh, Can I ask a question? Here. Yeah, please. Yeah, it's a, it's a general question and it's based on my ignorance. So if I look at this theorem by you, Bruno Barber and Baker, or, yep. um, it seems to me like, you know, it's an arrival point from the point of view of all minimality, but it's a starting point for geometry. So what kind of things do you uh, think are possible uh, starting from this theorem, like I study uh, reasonable families of singular varieties. What do you think is possible starting from this theorem? Um, like what sort of geometric consequences you mean? Yeah, no, if you have something in mind that, you know, it's a, it's a it's really um, interesting geometric situation that was not approachable before. And now, even if you don't know how to do it, you think that it's uh, possible to tackle and you find it interesting in your own opinion. That's a great question. Um, and I wish either Ben or Johan were here to answer it because uh, I'm really not the, the algebraic geometry expert. Uh, so I unfortunately don't know. I mean, I think pr practically um, it's not so much the theorem, but again, we, we sort of introduce um, uh, I think a, a line bundle that has been previously unstudied, or at least not in this generality, which might give some interesting information in some concrete geometric scenarios. But that's the level of abstraction at which I can answer the question. Uh, I don't right. have Thank anything you. specific in mind. Yeah, no, no worries. It's a great question. I'm just not the right person to answer it. Thanks. Um, okay, so let's um, let's slow down a bit, and I want to give um, just an example. Of, of mixed hard structures, which um, will sort of illustrate a little bit what we're going to do and how things look. So let's start with an elliptic curve E. So H1 of E has a pure hard structure, but if we, I'm sorry, remove some points, let's remove two points P and Q, we get an open curve 
and uh, then its H1 is going to carry a mixed Hodge structure. So let's describe that kind of explicitly. Um, you have uh, this exact sequence uh, in cohomology where your H1 um, in U has the sub, which is the H1 over E, and then it has a restriction map to this compactly supported cohomology group. And uh, if you sort of go through it, it turns out that the quotient by H1E is just this line, this one dimensional piece uh, Z, which should be thought of as having uh, weight two. So we just write it as Z twisted by minus one. And if you think of this as um, having uh, the weight filtration, then the H1 from E piece just is the weight one piece. Uh, the whole thing is weight two. So H1 of U, the entire H1 group uh, is, uh, is W sub two. And the graded pieces are on the one hand, just the cohomology over E, which is pure of weight one, and the cohomology over, uh, and the Z minus one thing, um, which is uh, pure of weight two. So this is uh, how the mixed hard structure looks. So because the, um, the, uh, this graded piece uh, only has an F0 and an F1, and so does this graded piece, um, the whole mixed hard structure only has an F0 and an F1. The F0 just comes from the H1E part. And so in fact, it's enough to specify um, what the uh, Hodge filtration is, the, the weight one Hodge filtration, the, sorry, the, uh, the F1 piece of the Hodge filtration is uh, globally in order to determine the entire mixed Hodge structure. So what is the F1 piece? Well, we know that intersected with this H1E, you get uh, the usual F1, so just global sections uh, of the canonical bundle. And we know its quotient has to contain this. So F1 is some two-dimensional subspace of this three-dimensional space, which contains the one-dimensional part coming from um, H1E and is just one extra thing. So if you fix these two graded pieces, if you think of them as fixed and what varies is, for example, uh, P and Q, then the choices of F1 are just parameterized by a lift a choice of lift of the, of the line down here up to H1U. So that's this H1EC. And then quotient out by the stuff you already have, which is the F1 part. <clears throat> and that's, you can think of as the same as just the elliptic curve up to integral isomorphism because it's the H1 of the elliptic curve mod its F1 piece mod integral points. And in fact, if you work it out in this particular case, the um, concrete class you correspond to is just given by uh, the point P minus Q uh, on your elliptic curve. <clears throat> okay, so this is how uh, this, this piece um, sort of breaks down. And so we're gonna think of it this way. We have the entire moduli space of mixed hard structures. And uh, that maps down to the moduli space of gra the graded sort of, where you just remember the graded pure hard structures, the pure hard structures and the graded pieces. And in this case, uh, because the Z1 is constant, the bottom thing is just Y1, the moduli space of elliptic curves. And your mixed guy is the universal elliptic curve over this moduli space. So in this case, uh, Griffith's universality is automatic because it's only F0 and F1. So you don't have to worry about things being Griffith's transverse. Uh, that's uh, that's free. But unlike the pure case where you just have uh, negative curvature and that sort of controls everything, uh, that's not true in this case. In the flat directions, the fiber directions, uh, you have zero curvature. And so um, you don't have the geometric input. And so here, for example, you need admissibility to make sure your period map behaves well in the flat direction. So for example, one like thing to keep in mind that you want to rule out is the fibers here are given by elliptic curves E and given elliptic curve E, it's got a natural covering space map from C, which you can think of as an algebraic variety. That's just the affine line. And you know, this map is the furthest possible thing from definable because it's periodic with a discrete uh, uh, period, Z squared, the thing you quotient out by. And so um, it's not enough to require Gouvish's reality in this case, you exactly have to rule these kinds of things out. And that's the sort of thing that um, admissibility does for you. <clears throat> um, 
And yeah, so you don't need uh, to come from geometry. Again, both theorems work, uh, everything works perfectly well if you look at abstract admissible maps, but if you have geometry, then results of Steinbrick and Zucker tells you that uh, you are admissible. And so this kind of weird thing doesn't happen. Okay, so where does the polarization come from in the mixed case? We say it's, it's quasi-projective, the image, and so we have to have some sort of line bundle. So the way we think about it is the following. Uh, the image under our map is some variety Z. I'm running down here. You can break, break Z down by first looking at the graded image, so the image inside M sub GR, where you forget the extension data. We know that this is quasi-projective coming from the Griffiths bundle. And so all we have to do to get um, a, a bundle on, on Z is get a relatively ample bundle from the projection map from Z to its graded image Z graded. So really I gotta give you a bundle uh, of M over uh, the, the graded uh, moduli space. And so in the universal elliptic curve case or more generally in the abelian variety case, if you look at like the universal family of abelian varieties, um, you have the theta bundle. Uh, and that's gonna be the thing uh, that we generalize in order to get uh, this relatively ample bundle of M over its graded. So to do this, we're sort of going to uh, have a bunch of these intermediate steps. We're gonna work one weight at a time. So we're gonna set M subgraded with this bracket K to mean the following. So if K is zero, this is just the graded, uh, where we remember just the graded pieces. And for other values of K, what we do is we're going to remember the extension data, but only up to sort of level K extensions. So for every W, we can look at uh, the quotient of the uh, little w piece mod the w minus k plus one piece. So we're gonna remember this, this records sort of k different weights and the extensions between them at a time. And then we're gonna take the product, but with the circle on top, which just means that you want some compatibility. So if you take two consecutive guys, they, in, they overlap uh, on k minus one sort of weights, and we want the extension data there to be the same as gotten from either, uh, from either one. So you don't want, this is just some, like this circle just means you have this compatible product where you're not recording some weird extra stuff. Okay, but so you sort of, uh, you have this tower where you start from M graded and then you record the weight one data and then the weight two data and so forth. And so you can study these guys uh, over each other one step at a time. And so the way it works is the following. So uh, the graded one, uh, piece. So that's where everything, that's where sort of the interesting stuff happens. Uh, it turns out here we're just remembering the, the level one extension data, sort of two consecutive weights at a time. And that's going to be relatively ample for some analogs, some pretty direct analog of the theta bundle in the abelian variety setting, which I'm going to describe. And then, uh, sorry, all the other weights, uh, the map is actually quasi affine. So uh, to get from, it, it turns out beyond extension one, you can just take O and that's already relatively ample. Uh, so you have to add something interesting for, um, for uh, the level one data, and then you just pull that back to the very top. And uh, from that point on, you're, uh, you're relatively ample. Okay, so that's how the story looks. So let me start by focusing on the theta bundle. So what happens on these um, level one extensions. So to start, let's just consider general extensions um, where V, V can be here actually a mixed hard structure of negative weight, of negative weights, but you can think of it as a pure hard structure uh, if you like. And we're gonna study extensions of uh, Z zero, which is just the one dimensional pure hard structure of weight zero uh, by negative weight mixed hard structures V. And if you work it out like before in terms of lifting filtration pieces, uh, this just parameterized uh, because you just have to lift basically F0, this is parameterized uh, by this quotient um, of V by its F0 part and its integral points. So how does this look? Well, if you have weight negative one, if V has weight negative one, where now we're allowing negative weights and we're allowing like ineffective hard structures. So, you know, arbitrary, uh, the weight filtration doesn't just start at zero. It can start anywhere and end anywhere. Uh, if V has weight negative one, then F naught is exactly half, is sort of exactly the halfway point. And so like in the abelian variety case, you get a compact complex torus because the quotient of VC by its F naught part 
is isomorphic to its real points. So you just get VR mod VZ, which is a which is compact. And um, in this compact complex torus, remember you have a polarization on the whole thing, and so in fact you get an analytic line bundle on this compact complex torus um, in the usual way. I'll describe it in a different way in a second, but uh, you can use the the, the usual sort of uh, co-cycles to give you a line bundle on this on this torus. And so uh, given a uh, mixed hard structure E, um, you can get a line bundle on the space of these extensions. So if we're studying general mixed hard structures E for any little W, you can look at this, uh, this quotient where you only care about the weight W and weight W minus one pieces uh, and the sort of extension you get between them. And um, you can get this line bundle theta because here we're studying the special case where V is weight minus one extending by Z zero. But in fact, the general case where you have the extension of two consecutive guys, you can do this kind of trick where giving an extension here is the same as giving an extension by Z zero of this tensor product, where you look at the W minus one guy, you tensor with the dual of the W guy, you get some weight minus one thing, very ineffective, uh, but weight minus one and pure, and you get this kind of extension. And so this is where this line bundle um, theta comes from. <clears throat> so that's rather, um, in a sense, it's inexplicit. In a sense, it's actually uh, extremely explicit because you can give, a, you know, your polarization form gives you an explicit co-cycle you can use to get this line bundle. But here is another way to think about it in terms of the uh, by-extension bundle. So uh, let me describe what that is. This is studied by uh, Prost and Brosnan, perhaps earlier as well. Uh, so let D be some moduli space of weight minus one hard structures, of polarized weight minus one hard structures. So D is a pure moduli space. So like Ziegel space, for example, uh, or something more general, because it could be ineffective. And now we're going to associate to D two different uh, moduli space of mixed hard structures. So the first one is extensions uh, by something of Z0 by something in D. And the second one is extensions I'm sorry, this is a typo. Z0 should be Z minus one here. Uh, that's, my, that's my bad. Uh, is extensions of something in D by Z minus, uh, by Z1, by Z1, because the way the weighting works is Z1 has weight negative two, by something in Z1. So you consider both of these kind of extensions. And now we're gonna have a third moduli space uh, where now we're, we're looking at mixed hard structures of weights negative two, negative one, and zero, or negative zero as I wrote here. Um, where the graded pieces are Z minus one, something in D, and then Z zero. Okay, so you have a natural map from this big moduli space uh, beta to these moduli spaces M and M prime, just given by forgetting either the, uh, either forgetting the uh, weight minus two thing, sort of starting at minus one, sort of quotienting out by that, or forgetting the weight zero thing, just going up to weight minus one. And then if you map down to, um, to D, if you just this is just recording the, the negative one graded piece. So you have a map to this kind of fiber product. And it turns out that this map um, is in fact an analytic GM torsor, where the GM you can think of as extensions of Z minus one by, uh, by Z zero, of Z zero by Z minus one. Uh, and so this gives you some kind of analytic line bundle, which I'm going to call P, um, on uh, this, this fiber product down here, M cross M prime over D. So again, what is this space? This space says, uh, let's record a, a V, a weight minus one hard structure, and let's simultaneously record an extension uh, of Z zero by that, and an extension of that by Z minus one. That's what this bottom space is. Okay, and that gives, you a mod that gives you a line bundle on M, uh, on this fiber product rather. But in fact, if you dualize an extension of one type, you get an extension uh, of the other type. And so in fact, you have this kind of diagonal map from M to this fiber product. And this P will in fact pull back to uh, the theta bundle that we described above. So this is another presentation um, of the theta bundle in terms of this by extension bundle. <laughs> And what's going on is uh, in the usual abelian variety setting, P is the Poincaré bundle on A cross A dual. This diagonal map gives you the map from A to A cross A dual, because if you have a polarization, you get, a, you get an isogeny from A to A dual. And then if you pull back the Poincaré bundle, you exactly get 
um, the theta bundle. And so this is a generalization of what's happening in the familiar abelian variety setting to this more general setting. Okay, so let me um, expand on something I, I said yesterday. Uh, this is just a sidetrack on like uh, definable analytic spaces. So you can think of B of beta, I, I talked about this with Ben yesterday to get it clearer in my head. You can think of beta as a definable analytic principal homogeneous space over GM. So in other words, if you look at this, uh, the map, uh, the, the action of GM on beta, which again is given by this, uh, by this uh, extension class, everything is definable here and it's all holomorphic. Then you get this isomorphism. Uh, this is the categorical way of sort of putting it. So point Y is an isomorphism and in a definable category, you get this isomorphism as well. Like GM cross beta is isomorphic to beta cross beta over this base. And here's a question which is open, though I don't think that many people have thought about it, but Ben and I couldn't figure it out, um, which is, is beta a definable analytic line bundle? In other words, is there like M cross M prime is now a, has a definable structure. And so you can ask, can you break it up into finitely many definable open sets over which beta has sections? So this is a concrete example where we uh, don't know the answer. And um, I suspect the answer is no, just because we tried some stuff and couldn't figure it out. And it seems like if there was something, it'd probably be pretty easy to actually uh, write down, but there's sort of subtle reasons why uh, the obvious ideas don't work. Uh, so my guess is the answer is no. Uh, but, you know, I'm like 60-40 on it. Uh, but anyway, I think, I think it's an uh, interesting question which shows up in like a concrete way. Okay. Um, so here is the theorem. Um, so it's due to, uh, the general case is due to myself and uh, Ben and, and Johan, but um, it's, it's heavily based on the theorem of Brosnan and, Pure, and Prostein, which is that if you look at this uh, beta and you pull it back along an admissible mixed period map, to, uh, from an algebraic base, then in fact you get an algebraic uh, line bundle or an algebraic GM torus or whatever you want to think about it as. Um, and let me just briefly sketch out the proof. So um, in the smooth case, this is just straight up proved by Brosnan and Perlstein. Uh, and essentially the proof, the way their proof goes is uh, they take a compactification of X um, and they show that your line bundle extends and they just apply Gaga. Um, and this is a non-trivial thing, even if you put in the definable theory, because like I mentioned yesterday, for a definable line bundle, there's an obstruction to extending it to a compactification given by some H2Z class. And so you have to study this H2Z class, show that it vanishes, uh, and then you get some extension and, and you get um, algebraic. So you can rephrase their proof in the definable language. It's perhaps a little cleaner in that language to rephrase it but we can't really replace their proof. We have to sort of go through the same kind of things they do, even in the smooth case. Um, okay, and then for uh, a general X, like if X is singular, you do the following trick. So first you resolve X by something smooth, and then uh, the pullback to your smooth guy Y is algebraic by the result of Brosnan and Perlstein. And what is your pullback to X? Well, it's just the period image. You have a map from, uh, from BY to B, to beta, sorry. Beta is just a mixed period domain. I mean, it's kind of a weird one because it's a weird fiber product thing, but you can think of it as a, as a mixed, uh, a moduli space of mixed hard structures. And so B sub X is just the image under a mixed period map of B sub Y. Uh, and so it's algebraic by the algebraization lemma. So that's how you can get to the general case uh, using this algebraicity theorem. So all this is to say that uh, the state of bundle that we defined point-wise, uh, in fact, glues up to give you something um, algebraic on your base X. Oops. Okay. So uh, let me now explain how the um, ambulance is proven. So again, we did this one weight at a time. So then to get our theta, we just tensor up over all the weights, these uh, theta bundles, and that gives us a global theta bundle which is going to be what's actually relatively ample. So why is this true? So this, the map from the weight one extension moduli space, just the graded moduli space is proper because the fibers are compact complex tori. So the map on uh, your images is proper as well. And that means to show that your bundle is relatively ample, it's enough to work on fibers. 
So let's see what happens uh, one fiber um, at a time. So this is kind of poor notation, but I'm gonna let F be the fiber and F superscript stuff means the filtration piece. So I apologize for that confusion. Um, but so your fiber maps to uh, this compact complex torus, which is not algebraic, it's genuinely not algebraic in general. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, it turns out that the image of your fiber inside this compact complex torus is just a finite union of translates of a billion varieties, which are polarized by theta in the usual way because it's just the theta bundle on them. It's the usual theta bundle on these a billion varieties you get inside your compact complex tori. Um, so just very briefly, I want to explain how this is proven because it's, very, it, it, it's, uh, it's not very hard. Uh, so the claim is that if you, if you have a map to this compact complex tori, uh, then the image is contained inside some abelian subvarieties. Um, so you reduce to like the nice case uh, by definability where uh, you can, your F contains zero and it's closed, reducible, irreducible, um, all that stuff's easy to get. And then if you keep applying the difference map, uh, you eventually stabilize by definability and dimension theory and you get some like subgroup and then everything is definable. So in fact, what you get is some compact complex sub torus but now the point is that um, your Griff is transverse. The image of F is Griff is transverse. So you have some Griff is transverse compact complex subtorus. Um, and so if you let HZ be the sort of integral monodromy of your compact complex subtorus, uh, that in fact you lie here, you have to lie in, in, uh, in this quotient. So F is going to be, is going to equal this quotient here, which must be the same as the real points, more the integral points, because uh, your guy is compact complex. Okay, so in particular, um, the F0 thing must be uh, half of the dimension. And so because you lie inside F minus one, uh, that means your weights are just minus one and zero. Uh, and so it must be a sub hot structure of weights minus one and zero. And so it's gotta be in a billion variety. Or rather, like, a bean is usually given as 0, 1, but the dual of it is, is minus 1 and 0. And that must be what happens here. So it really comes down to just uh, Griffith's transverse subtori of your compact complex tori are abelian varieties. That's, that's what this claim comes down to. So it's kind of interesting because in a family, what's sort of going on, if you look at the graded 1 piece at least, uh, what's happening are your fibers are these abelian varieties, and they all have uh, theta bundles. But in fact, it can sort of change which abelian variety you get. Um, you can change dimensions and you can change polarization types, but somehow because you come from a single mixed family, the theta bundles glue up to a global theta bundle. Um, that's kind of the story of what's going on here. Okay, so that's the weight one story. So let me say something about uh, the remaining weights. So um, let's talk about the quasi-affineness of the map to just remembering the weight one pieces. So quasi-affineness can't be checked on fibers, but uh, just uh, let's pretend it can for a second to see what's happening point by point. So let's play the same game as before, where we consider extensions uh, of level two. So the toy case is extensions of Z zero by some mixed hard structure V, uh, which now has weights strictly below minus one. Um, now, if K is less than actually minus two, if you want, uh, if, 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 uh, if V has weights minus three and below, um, then in fact, being Griffiths transverse means that your image just consists of points. So the fibers are just points, and this is because you have no integral Griffiths transverse directions. Um, so point by point, sort of everything is really simple. Nothing interesting is happening. Um, you get something, uh, something quasi finite. If, oh, uh, weird, okay. If your weight is minus two, something kind of interesting does happen, which is that um, you, you do have some integral uh, Griffith transverse directions. They exactly correspond to the Hodge vectors, to the Hodge directions, uh, which I'm gonna call Hodge V right here of, of weight minus one, minus one, of, piece minus, of grading minus one, minus one. And uh, that must be where all your monodromy lies um, in the hard directions. So then if you look at your map to your JV, which is now not a compact complex torus, it's just some like 
affine compl complex affine space mod some discrete subgroup. Um, then, in fact, all the monodromy is contained um, in the Hodge direction, so you can lift to this GM to the R cross C to the S by unpacking all the other directions. And you only land, you sort of only end up, whoop, sorry, you only end up moving in these Hodge directions. So you, only, you, you land inside finitely many fibers uh, of GM to the R. Um, and GM is affine, basically. So essentially, you only get finitely many copies of some power uh, of GM in, in the weight minus two thing, which only show up from Hodge directions. Something interesting happens here, by the way, which I want to just briefly, briefly mention. So if you look at extensions of um, Z0 by something of weight minus two, and you look at a mixed period map, you can then ask, well, how big are these fibers? What dimension do these fibers have? And you know, a priori, the dimension is bounded by um, the dimension of your Hodge locus, of your, of, your, uh, of your V. So if you don't have any Hodge vectors, then you just can't have any, any fibers. And then if you have, uh, if, if, if it jumps all of a sudden and you get some Hodge vectors, then you can get some actual uh, fibers in there. So you can sort of cheat and make some kind of easy examples where the dimension of your image varies um, just by kind of working in something where this Hodge, you can, you can take a family where this Hodge uh, locus is always, the, the set of Hodge vectors is always uh, at least one dimensional. And you can just take a sub, which is like points everywhere and then gain the dimension. You can kind of cheat in that way. But we made uh, an example, which I think is interesting, a, a genuinely geometric example by looking at the moduli space of like K3 surfaces with elliptic curves. Uh, and what happens there is if you look at the image in the corresponding mixed period domain, which exactly gives you this kind of structure, it's an extension of Z0 by a pure weight minus two thing, um, then it's usually points because it has to be points. So usually this, uh, your weight minus two thing has no Hodge vectors. And so you get something zero dimensional. And then uh, on some sub locus, uh, in fact, this jumps, you get something one dimensional. And now all of a sudden you're allowed potentially to have a higher dimensional image. And in fact, you do. So uh, it's sort of a weird geometric phenomenon where you have this kind of uh, criterion limiting the dimension of these fibers. And uh, it in fact can be realized geometrically in some, in some sort of genuine way, which, um, yeah. Okay, but so to finish, I'll just say uh, a couple of words here. So um, first of all, so how do you get from, uh, we sort of pretend that point by point, it's enough to check, but it's not in fact. So how do you check that uh, you actually get something quasi-affine? So first of all, it's enough to check your uh, definably quasi-affine instead of algebraically, which is really nice because it's very hard to work algebraically on the base. It's much easier to work uh, with um, definable neighborhoods. Uh, and the idea is basically that if you have a, uh, an algebraic map from, from X to Y, and you have uh, a, an open neighborhood such that your pre-image is cut out by, by definable analytic functions, what you want is to upgrade them as to algebraic functions. And what you do is the following, you use the fact that algebraic maps are all compactifiable and definable analytic functions extend meromorphically. And once you have that, then you have algebraic functions just by normal Gaga. So basically definable, the definability allows you to get this meromorphic extension and then you're back in the algebraic world. So this is kind of a nice straightforward lemma saying quasi affineness um, can be checked definably, which is nice because it can't be checked analytically. Uh, so this is another, uh, this is sort of known, this is another advantage of working in the definable analytic world instead of the analytic world. Okay, so now uh, to finish, how do you upgrade from just points to, um, to, to the whole thing, even in definable neighborhoods? Well, the idea is you have to show your monodromy is Hodge. Um, so if you look at the map from the entire image, to just this weight one uh, extension data, uh, then what you do is you have to show that if you start with a point on this weight one uh, image uh, and you take a contractible neighborhood of it and look at its pre-image, then you have sort of a monodromy representation of the local H1, which could be something pretty complicated um, in, the, uh, in the general case if this is not smooth. And you have to show that the monodromy image is Hodge. That's what it sort of comes down to. And to do that, you use Cytos theory 
of Hodge modules and that kind of makes, once you unwind everything, uh, that makes everything work. Uh, all right, that's all I had. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jacob, for the oh, very nice and oh, very informative um, pair of lectures. I think uh, we have any questions or comments? No, it was your example about k fries and and curves uh, written anywhere or is yeah it's in the paper uh it's in the it's in the uh, algebra city paper okay mm -hmm. thanks mm -hmm. no problem <clears throat> does anything special happen when the mixed hot structures the associated graded or all hot tape right that's a great question um, not that we can detect yet. Uh, I mean, that, that's an important, you know, that's an important question for obviously for compactifying uh, in the general case, right? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so we, we can't, we can't see anything special happening yet. Though we, we have thought about it. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? If not, I'd like to once again uh, thank you, Jacob, 